Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the vicar here at Ascension, and it's great to be with you today. It's not fair. It's just not fair. How come my sister in Newbury was allowed to visit my parents on the south coast because they were in tier one and my wife and I were expecting a little baby couldn't visit my parents on the south coast because we're in tier two yet the Wandsworth coronavirus rate was far lower than the rate in Newbury it's just not fair someone came to me the other week and he said this how come we clap for the NHS workers they haven't lost their jobs like I have they haven't lost their pension like I have. They haven't lost all their savings that they've put into the business that I tried to start. They haven't got all of those problems. It's just not fair. And then a friend of mine who is a teacher during half term, I, I met up with her. And she said, how come others get to isolate during this period? How come others get to protect themselves? We've got to be out there on the front line with the children, like the NHS workers as well, on the front line with the patients. We don't get to isolate and look after ourselves during this period. It's just not fair. And this morning, we come to one of the most famous stories in the Bible from Luke chapter 15. A father has two sons. The younger son says, stuff you, dad. I want my half of the inheritance right now. And the father gives him his half of the inheritance. And the younger son goes off to far-flung lands. And he spends his money on partying, on drink, on drugs, on entertaining prostitutes. And then, and then... He comes to his senses and he realizes what he's done and he runs home, he runs home, he runs back to his father's house and there is his father on the road all ready to meet him and his father embraces him and welcomes him back and throws a party for him. And then this happens in Luke chapter 15 verse 25, it says this, Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. It's not fair. That bit isn't actually in the Bible, I've added that bit. But that's what the elder brother is saying, it's not fair. And the elder brother shows that our cry of it's not fair has been echoing through the generations and across the millennia. Now, don't get me wrong. God is a fair and just God. And there is nothing wrong with wanting to put right the injustices of the world. But there is a dark side in all of this. In our zeal for justice, in our, our zeal for fairness, there is a dark side. A dark side that can poison all of our relationships. A dark side that we can flip into. And here at Ascension, we're in the middle of a series thinking about health and specifically spiritual health. And we're thinking about how we can be spiritually healthy. And the dark side that I want to talk about this morning, the dark side that could end up impacting our health more than any virus, the dark side, ladies and gentlemen, is envy. Envy. What is envy? 
Envy, Tim Keller tells us, is wanting somebody else's life or wanting an aspect of somebody else's wife. <laughs> life even. You see that they have got something better or um, they are better and instead of rejoicing in the good they have, you weep over the fact that you don't have it. Instead of rejoicing over the good news they have, you weep over the fact. You're obsessed with. You focus on the fact that you don't have what they've got. Envy is wanting somebody else's life or an aspect of somebody else's life. But it actually goes beyond that. Not only do we want someone else's life or an aspect of someone else's life, we resent their lives. We begrudge them their lives. In praise, we notice where someone is better than us. And we say, wow, that's amazing, fantastic, that's great. In praise, we recognize people who are better than us and we just rejoice in it. But in envy, you recognize people who have it better than you or are better than you and you resent it. You are angry about it. You hate it. You begrudge it. Envy is being unhappy at other people's happiness. Envy is weeping because people rejoice. And if you don't believe that you're envious, envy works also in reverse. Not only do you feel bad when people are better than you, but when people above you fall down, you like it. Envy is happy at other people's unhappiness and unhappy at other people's happiness. It weeps because of those rejoicing and rejoices when they are weeping. So what else is so bad about envy? Well, envy hides itself. I spoke a couple of weeks ago on pride, and I spoke about the lettuce on the teeth. But in the same way as pride, envy also hides itself from ourselves. To be angry in our culture can be seen as self-assertive. Lust can be seen as just being sexually appealing to others. Sloth can be seen as chilling out and not getting antsy about everything. Yet envy, even people who would say they're non-religious, don't like envy. It smacks of being small, pathetic, petty, inadequate. And so we'll do anything we can to avoid facing up to the fact that we could be envious. And it's striking how seldom we talk about envy when so much of contemporary culture is built on it. Celebrity culture, social media, is based almost entirely around envy. When you look at Love Island, oh my goodness, look at those incredible bodies. Wow, I wish my body looked like that. Or, wow, what amazing acting talent. I wish I could act like that. Or, wow, what amazing sporting talent. I wish I could play sport like that. A pastor of a church wrote this about his use of social media. He said this, it's really good to hear that so-and-so has written a book, is planning a conference, or is planting a church. That's really encouraging in isolation. But a constant stream of such social media posts makes me envy other people's achievements on a daily basis. Not good. And what's interesting about envy is that it's likely both the most hated and yet the most cultivated of all sins in our modern world. And so often we cry out, something's not fair, it's an injustice, it needs to be tackled for justice reasons. When if we're being honest, the real motivation in our hearts is an aggrieved spirit. We feel envious. We're not just sad, we're more than that. We begrudge the situation or the person. We resent 
the other. So envy, part of its issue, is that it hides itself. It's so humiliating to admit it. So this morning I've got a question for us to ponder. Look at your own life right now and ask yourself this. Is it possible that at the bottom of the problems you're having right now is actually envy? Who are you super critical of? Sure, they may not be perfect, but at the heart of your issue is the issue actually your heart, the issue of envy. Some of us are just filled with a continual sense of self-pity with our lives. We're always feeling worse off than absolutely everyone else. Could that simply be a pervasive envy, an all-encompassing envy of everyone and everything that is souring our whole lives? And when you see bad people, powerful bad people being brought down, you know, let's think of Harvey Weinstein. Actually, it's, it's all right to think, man, he had his comeuppance. That's not envy. But let's be honest. How do you feel when good people you like even, people you admire, people you get on with, people you enjoy, how do you feel when they mess up? Or maybe when things don't go their way? It's comforting, isn't it? It's not actually as bad or as sad as we'd like to admit. We want to hear about it. We want to console them. But actually, that's envy. Envy rejoices when people weep. And envy is your problem and my problem and all of our problems. So the first problem is that envy hides itself. But not just that. Envy kills joy. Bishop Graham Tomlin says this, out of all the sins, envy is different. It is different because it is the one sin on the list that has no pleasure in it whatsoever. From start to finish, envy is no fun at all. It is the most miserable of habits. Joseph Epstein wasn't a Christian. Um, he doesn't believe in God as far as I'm aware, but he wrote a book on envy. He was fascinated with this topic on envy and he says this, we've all felt flashes of envy, even if in varying intensities, from its minor pricks to its deep soul-destroying lacerating stabs. Here's another question for you. Where is joy and happiness draining out of your life because of the holes envy has stabbed in your soul? Our mission here at Ascension is to spread the love of God to Balaam and beyond. And the problem with envy is that it poisons the ability to love. Love does not envy, says St. Paul in the famous 1 Corinthians that's read at so many weddings. Love does not envy. No, it poisons things. It poisons the joy in our own life and it poisons the joy in the lives of others and in all of our relationships. I know some people who are only friends with people who are going through hard times. Because envy is such a big issue in their life, it would be too painful to be friends with people for whom life's going better than their life. And that's envy. How can we love Balaam and beyond if deep down we want to destroy anyone who experiences love, life and joy more than us? And if you find that nothing's good enough, your job, your body, your marriage, your friends, your living accommodation, if none of it is ever good enough, if you just can't sit still for a moment and enjoy what you do have, then you may be suffering with envy because you're comparing yourself to others and resenting what they have that you don't have. And it has killed your joy. As the expression goes, compare and despair. So, 
Envy hides itself. Envy prevents us from experiencing joy in our lives and in the joy in the lives of others. It's self-destructive and it's actually a form of self-sabotage. Wow. That's really bad news, isn't it, for all of us? It's massively bad news for me. It's massively bad news for you. It's bad news for all of us. Envy is endemic. So, what do we do about it? Well, I've got a few things that I think can help. The first is this. Let's stop playing God. In envy, we want to determine who should have what talents, who should have what looks, who should have what good fortune. We want to be in control of that. And our first grievance is never with the personal situation that we envy. No, our first grievance is actually with God. How dare he ordain things that way? How dare he? One of my favorite films of all time is Amadeus, and it features uh, two main characters, Salieri, who is the court composer in Vienna, and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And Salieri is envious of Mozart. He wishes he had the gifts and talents of Mozart. And there's this incredible scene where actually before he takes it out on Mozart, on Amadeus, he clenches his fists and he shakes them at God. How dare you, God, give that man those gifts and talents and not me? Our first issue is with God. How dare he? And in our Bible passage this morning, the older brother is angry with his father who represents God. It's not fair. And when we do that, we make ourselves the arbiter of what is fair and just and who should get what and how the chips should be apportioned. And in that moment, we are playing God. And that has never been our job description. His ways are not our ways. How many times have I compared my insides to the outsides of others, proclaiming to God, it's not fair making a judgment without knowing the full facts. When I first arrived as vicar here at Ascension seven years ago, I spent, I think, at least three months cultivating some background envy towards another pastor and his church up in central London. You should have seen their website. It was the best website ever. The people on it were so beautiful. I know we're beautiful as well. I know we're beautiful as well. You should have seen how many people they had. Little did I know of the sleepless nights that pastor was having because of the politics that were ripping his church apart and ripping him apart. And there I had been envying and telling God how bad my lot was compared to his. Only God has the full picture as to why things have been appointed and apportioned as they have been. And we should not presume to know why. Never mind presume that we know better. You see, God is just, and ultimately, all things will be revealed and made right. So the first thing we need to do is we need to stop playing God and trust in his unfailing love for our lives and recognize we don't have the full picture. Secondly, we can separate the ability from the person. Christianity thinks of our abilities not as things we possess, but instead as gifts. If someone is an incredible musician, that is a gift. And if something is a gift, it means there is a giver. And any credit for that gift actually belongs to God, the giver of everything. Christianity thinks of us first and foremostly as simple, created, beloved beings who are given gifts. And we're never to forget that these are gifts and not possessions. But the New Testament goes even further than that. 
and it has a far more communal vision of the gifts given to everyone. They're not for individuals primarily, they're to be shared for everyone to benefit from them. In fact, Paul in the New Testament, St. Paul talks about us being part of a big body. And if you've got the incredible gift of music, well, because we're part of the same body, I have that gift as well. Because you're brilliant at poetry, that's fantastic. We're all part of the same body. So I have that gift as well. And so recognizing that these gifts are that, they are gifts. They're not possessions. And we can actually sit back and thank God for the gifts that he has given to different people. The third thing that can really help is an attitude of gratitude. Actually shifting the focus from others onto what God has given to us. Every day I write a gratitude list and I find it so helpful to do so. It just allows me to enjoy the simple things that God has given me. It helps me center back on God's goodness to me. And I can really recommend it as something to do. But I want to finish with this one. Finally and foremostly, the antidote to envy is to soak in the love of God. A lot of envy comes out of fear of not having enough, not being enough, a fear of insignificance, a fear that if anyone knew how small I really felt inside, I would shrivel up and die. So we have to compare ourselves to others to feel better, except it makes us feel worse. It makes our world smaller, and it simply seems to confirm our gravest doubts that we really are not enough. And it leads us to want to tear down and destroy others who reinforce that broken image we hold of ourselves. And you see, the only thing that drives out self-hatred, a sense of not being enough, a sense of lacking, the only thing that drives that out is love. And supremely, the love of God. The Bible says that perfect love drives out all fear. And 2,000 years ago, the one who is perfect love went up on a cross to say that however you feel about yourself, God has a different perspective. That you are literally so precious, worth so much, that you are literally worth dying for. Your value is never in question. Don't think so little of yourself that you think your worth is on the line every day. Your worth is never on the line. Your worth is settled and it is infinite, immutable, eternal and not reliant on how you perceive yourself. You have been bought with a price, the price of Jesus himself. And today, we, you, me, we need the love of the most unenvious person who has ever lived. The person who actually has the right to be envious. The right to say, why should I be the one dying on a cross when I've done nothing wrong, whilst they live and yet have caused so much destruction? The one who has the right to say, that isn't fair. Yet Jesus the most unenvious person in history does not begrudge us, although he didn't get what he deserved. So we didn't get what we deserved. No. We need to bask in the one who delights in the differential between what he got and what we got. We need to experience the most unenvious unmerited, grace-filled, tender-hearted love of God in our hearts afresh today. And it is from a place of worship, of getting down on our knees, that we realize how ridiculous our envy is, that we, we've been given everything by the one who 
is everything, even when we did not deserve it. And so I believe that is the Father's word to us all today. We do not need to envy because we already have all that is of any eternal worth. The father says this to the elder son in our passage this morning. He says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So today, maybe where you are right now, if you're able to, why not just bow down? Bow down. Let's just get down. Let's just bow down. And let's bring any of our envy into the presence of the most unenvious God so that we can move from envy to joy, delight in having it all, and find rest for our souls. Amen. school.